Okay, so the next step in quantum theory is uh, happens about about eight years after, or eight, yeah, eight years after Einstein's uh, photoelectric effect. And now we look at the physicist Neil Bohr. And so the next problem that physicists could solve was the emission spectra of atoms. Now, the first time that someone actually thought about this was actually back to Sir Isaac Newton. And what he did was that he first showed that sunlight is composed of color components that can be combined to form white light. And this is the basis of studying emission spectra. Emission spectra. This is, it could be either continuous like the rainbow or could be a line spectra. And I'll show you what that mean in a, in a minute. All right, now spectroscopy, the, what we're talking, this field of emission spectra that we're talking about actually belongs to a bigger field called spectroscopy. Okay, scopy means study of, and spectro is a study, it, spectro means light in Greek. So spectroscopy is the is literally the study of light. Okay, so emission spectra of atoms in the gas phase does not show continuous spectra. They only produce bright lights at certain parts of the visible spectrum. Now, this phenomenon is called a line spectrum, which is the light emission only at specific wavelengths. And every element actually has its own combined, has its own unique line spectrum, which could be used to identify elements of a compound. Now, this is how science is actually uh, chemists back in the day actually figured out what elements are in a compound. Uh, what they did was take a compound and put it under high voltage. Uh, they had to take this comp uh, take this element, put it under high voltage. That element needed to be in the gas phase, otherwise it's going to burn. But what they did was take that light that comes off of that gas because you you excite you excite that gas. It's going to give off a light. You narrow down that light into a, by putting a slit right there so that way you only have one beam of light instead of a full full uh, full beam. So then you pass that beam of light through a prism and then it starts separating out by colors. And so what we're left with, these are the these these are the lines that have certain certain wavelengths and now we can actually figure out the energies of the photons that are giving off those line giving off those line spectra. Now, what we're looking at over here, these are the different line, spect line spectra for 20 various elements. Okay. Now, the one that we're going to focus in on is hydrogen. Okay. So, this is the one that we're going to pay, pay a lot of attention to. So, with hydrogen, I'm going to circle the spectra. They're somewhat difficult to see in black and white, but you will have lines Though you will have four different lines with hydrogen, and those are the ones I've circled. Okay, so what uh, what happens now is that in 1913, based on the work of Planck and Einstein, Niels Bohr presented a theoretical explanation of the emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom. Now, keep in mind that at this point in the story, the idea of the electrons was about 14 years old. Protons were only two years old. Okay. At this point, physicists pictured the atom as an entity in which electrons whirled around the nucleus in circular orbits at high velocities. So what they're think so the way that this is going to be kind of pictured is that let's say you've got a proton in the middle, okay? Because keep in mind that's that's what Rutherford decided uh, discovered in 19, 1911 that the nucleus is in the center and the electrons are on the outside. So here's your electron. So the electron is whirling around the nucleus in circular orbits at high velocities. Now what's going on is that because this electron is spinning around the nucleus, uh, 
at such a fast distance, okay, that the only thing that's kind of keeping it on its place is because it's being it's being spun around so quickly, there is that attraction between the electron and the proton. So this electron definitely wants to move towards the nucleus, but what's keeping it away is that this electron spinning around so quickly that the electron's pulling, pulling, feeling this pull that's pushing it out. So what's keeping it on its path is that these two forces, the forces of attraction and then this centripetal force is actually keeping the electron on its path, on this, on this orbit. Now, what Bohr is going to say, though, Bohr's idea is this. Bohr's idea says this, that the single electron, and this is spe specifically for the hydrogen atom because there's one proton and one electron, the single electron could only be located in certain orbits with certain energy values. Now this was a big, big idea that Bohr put forward, that the single electron could only be located in certain orbits with certain energy values. Because remember, this is going back to Planck now, Planck said that the orbits have to be quantized, so, there's, so the electron can only be in certain orbits. So the question is, why do we get the emission spectra for hydrogen? So again, hydrogen has those four bond or the four lines. Why do they show up there? Okay, so to explain why we get that, what Bohr said, Bohr's answer was this. Bohr's answer was this. The electrons got to drop from an excited energy level to a lower one. From an excited energy level to a lower one. And it releases... A photon, keep in mind, this is going back to the photoelectric effect, photon is light energy. So it releases a photon of energy. Okay. And that these energies, that the electron can possess, in the hydrogen atom are, and we have an equation for this, that the energy at a certain orbital, which I'm going to call n, okay, the energy of an orbital is going to be equal to something called the negative Rydberg constant, okay, so the Rydberg constant is capital R sub h, times the quantity 1 over n squared, okay? So let me explain this equation for a minute. E is energy. I think you guys knew that one already. R sub h is the, something called the Rydberg constant. And I'll give you that value in a minute. N is going to be the energy level. Okay, now the Rydberg constant is going to have a value, and it's right here, 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. Now, N is called the energy level. Its actual specific name is called the principal quantum number, and this refers to the energy level that the electron resides in. This is something that we're going to talk a lot more about near the end of this chapter. So we'll talk a little bit more about what n is, the principal quantum number, all that good stuff. Okay.
Now, n can only have positive integer values greater than zero. So n can only be one, two, three, and so on. Now, that negative sign in the equation, and I'll point to it, this is by convention because energy is being released and it's got to be exothermic. So because it's exothermic, that we've got to have that negative sign there. Now, if it was going the other way, let's say the electron's absorbing a proton, the sign would have to be positive because it's indicating it's absorbing, so it's got to be endothermic. Now, what's going on is that as n goes from infinity to zero, okay, so it's going, it's going from the outside towards the nucleus, okay? The energies are getting larger and more and more negative and because it's releasing more and more energy. And the most negative energy, where n equals 1, is called the ground state. And that means that n equals 2, 3, 4, or at any other level, these are called excited states, which are going to be higher in energy than the ground state. Okay. So all this being said, let's talk about the hydrogen atom now. So Bohr's theory allows us to explain the line spectrum of the hydrogen atom, and he says this. If a photon of light is absorbed by an electron, okay, it causes the electron to jump from a lower energy value, from a lower energy level, to a higher one. And if a photon of light is released, is released by an electron it causes an electron to jump from a higher energy level to a lower one Okay, so another way of uh, saying this, let's say the initial, we're going to say N because remember N is the, is the energy level. I'm going to say NI is the initial energy level and N sub F, this is your final energy level. Okay, so for the first case where the photon of light is absorbed and it causes the electron to jump from a higher energy from a lower energy level to a higher one that means that the initial energy level is going to be smaller or less than whatever the final is and in that case in that case the value of this energy of the photon is going to be positive because it's being absorbed now for the other case where it's being the photon is being released we're going from a higher energy level to a lower one. So the initial is going to be higher or have a greater value than the final. So that means that the number, the energy of the photon is actually going to be a negative. So to figure out how much energy is actually emitted during this transition, there's an equation that Bohr came up with. And he said this. Remember that the energy of a photon can be calculated by using the Planck relation, A equals H nu, but at the same time, this energy is also going to be equal to the Rydberg constant, R sub H, times the quantity, 1 over the initial energy value squared, minus the fi uh, 1 over the final energy value, also squared. Okay, so again, N sub I, that's the initial energy energy value or I'm sorry energy level and then n sub s n sub f is the final energy level 
Okay. So putting in our numbers, we know that if it's being emitted, the energy needs to be negative. And if it's being absorbed, the energy has got to be positive. So that's actually cool. If you pop these values in, you actually get the numbers that you get the negative and the positive sign automatically. So that's kind of nice. All right. So then we can actually, not only can we look at uh, visible light and study visible light in those transitions, but we can also take a look at ultraviolet and infrared lights as well. And so there were actually four scientists at the same time that Ryberg was doing this uh, back in the turn of the uh, 20th century. There was the Lyman uh, scientist by the name of Lyman who say the transitions of uh, everything ending at the n equals one energy level. Balmer was the guy who studied the everything ending at the n equals two energy level. Passion was a scientist that studied everything at the n equals three energy level. And then Brackett was the guy who studied at the n equals four. And so do you need to know these names? No. But this is actually where the, um, you know, you may hear about the Lyman or Balmer series. That's where these names are coming from. So that's that's primarily the idea behind the the Bohr theory. So uh, when there is actually a picture that kind of describes this, and I actually really do like this picture because it does sell a lot. If we've gotten, let's say we've got an electron over here at the n equals three energy level, and it's going to jump down to n equals two. In order to make that jump happen there's got to be a photon that's released in the process. So photons released and that electron can move from the n equals 3 down to the n equals 2 energy level. All right, so let's try a problem out. And you, this is actually a really nice problem because this combines a whole lot of stuff that we've been talking about with Planck, with Einstein, and with Bohr. So let's try this problem out. What is the wavelength in nanometers of a photon that's emitted during a transition from Ni equals 6 to Nf equals 4 in the hydrogen atom. So right off the bat, you know Ni, the initial energy level is 6, the final energy value is 4, and because you're seeing this word emitted automatically, you know the energy is going to be negative. Okay, so that's actually really helpful right off the bat. Okay, so what we're going to do is calculate, this is actually a three-step process. The first step is that we're going to calculate the energy that's emitted, of that photon emitted. Once we find that energy, then we're going to use the Planck relationship to find the frequency. And then once we have the frequency, then we can find the wavelength. Okay, so let's, let's try this out. So the first step is to use the Rydberg equation. So remember that E is equal to the Ryberg constant, R sub H, times the quantity 1 over Ni squared minus 1 over Nf squared. Now we know what Ni and Nf are, and the Ryberg constant, the Ryberg constant was 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. So we're just going to pop our values in. So you got 1 over 6 squared minus 1 over 4 squared. Okay, so uh, doing that work, you know, getting rid of the squares, let me bring over that constant first. Okay, so 6 squared would be 36, so you got 136th minus 116th. Okay, and if you take that fraction, 136th minus 116th, that fraction should come out to be negative 5 over 144th. Okay, and then you're going to multiply this by the Rydberg constant, 2.18 times 10 to the minus 18th joules. The value that we get is negative 7.57 times 10 to the minus 20th joules. So that's the energy of the photon that's being released. Now, again, that negative sign here, that negative sign tells us that the photon is being emitted which makes sense because again, that's what our problem told us at the very beginning. So that makes, so that all kind of jives together. All right, so now that we know our energy, the second step is we need to calculate the, the frequency of that photon. So we're gonna use the Planck relationship, E equals H nu. All 
Okay. We know what E is. We know the Planck constant, so we're going to solve for nu. So in order to get nu by itself, we have to divide both sides by H. So we're going to have the energy divided by Planck's constant. So I'm going to use the energy that we just calculated. Now, this is really important. Going forward, I know that this electron is being emitted, so I'm going to drop the negative sign going forward. So I'm going to say that the energy is 7.57 times 10 to the minus 20th joules. Okay. This is divided by the Planck constant, 6.6 6 So 6.63 times 10 to minus 34th joule seconds. Now, if I do that work, 7.57 times 10 to the minus 20th divided by 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34th, the value I get is 1.14 times 10 to the positive 14th hertz. Or you could say it is 1 over seconds. Either way. Now this is really important. The reason why we drop that negative sign for the energy is that way you can't have a negative frequency. Waves can't be going backwards. Okay? So... You can't have a negative frequency. You can't have a negative wavelength. So we got to drop that negative sign after we got that energy. So then the final step, we're going to use uh, the speed of light is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. We know frequency. We know the speed of light. So we're going to solve for wavelength. So we're going to divide both sides by nu. So wavelength lambda is equal to the speed of light divided by the frequency or 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second divided by the frequency we just calculated, 1.14 times 10 to the 14th, one over seconds. So I'll use one over seconds this time so that way the units cancel out. So seconds and one over seconds cancel out and we're left with meters. So we're gonna be left with 2.63 times 10 to the minus sixth meters. Now there's one thing that's missing. The problem's asking for us to calculate the wavelength in nanometers. So we now need to convert our meters to nanometers. So uh, remember in one meter there's 10 to the ninth nanometers. Okay. So if we multiply 2.63 times 10 to the minus 6 times 10 to the ninth, the ans the final answer is that we should get 2630 nanometers.